Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Trent, thanks for coming on the show. Dan, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so you have a very interesting background, and I think this this tends to be a fun type of interview for us, which is an agency owner that's transitioned to you know new and interesting things in the software space, if that's uh, in, in other kind of like more scalable spaces, let's say, for what you're doing at Flowster. Um, but before we get into that, can you talk a little bit about, about your background and, and how you got to where you are now? Sure, I'll try not to drone on for too long. My entrepreneurial journey started way back in 2001 when I started my first company. And very quickly after starting that business, which was in the IT space, I ran across a book uh, called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And that book had a profound impact on my thinking about how to run a business because I was a first time business owner. And so I didn't know what I didn't know. I don't have a college degree. I didn't go to business school. So, I mean, I really had no idea what the hell I was doing. And so this was a very helpful book. And, and ultimately that business, uh, eight years after I started it, was sold for $1.2 million. And for a kid that grew up with parents on welfare at one point in time, that was a pretty big deal for me. And that was a real uh, pivotal game changer moment in my life. And, and I went into what I call a mini retirement after that. And it was at that point in time that I accidentally discovered the whole online business, make money online thing. I started off as an Amazon affiliate. I started a blog. I started a podcast. I started hiring virtual assistants from the Philippines. So this was probably in 2010. So again, a good amount of time ago. And over the last 10 years, one thing has led to another. And it's always been, I guess, the, the, the thing that has never wavered is my desire to be able to run a business or not to run necessarily, to own a business, because there's a distinction between the two, that uh, gave me a high level of freedom in my life. Because that is an exceptionally, that's probably next to health, that's probably my most important value is freedom. I just literally hate being told what to do. My wife is exactly the same way. So needless to say, we don't try and tell each other what to do. <laughs> and um, so in 2016, uh, thanks to, again, some more uh, serendipity as a result of somebody I had on my podcast, I discovered the Amazon space. And that's when I launched uh, my company, which I, I call the Amazon Hybrid Agency. And we grew like crazy. You'll notice behind me on the wall, if I move over, there's a couple of Inc. 5000 plaques. That's the company that won those plaques. And the cool thing, I guess my quote unquote claim to fame is I only worked there for the first 12 months. And after that, I delegated myself completely out of the business. And that was largely as a result of a little bit more luck and opportunity crashing into one another. So the first year I was super focused on writing SOPs for the client prospecting process because it was really boring and repetitive and I didn't want to do it. And then I hired people in the Philippines to do all that work. That uh, obsession played out very, very well. So we did 1.1 million, I think, in our first 12 months. And I got invited to speak from stage to a group of 500 other uh, Amazon agency owners. And I did not have a software company back then. I didn't have anything for sale. I got up on stage and I said, hey, everybody, thanks for having me. I don't have anything for sale. I'm just going to share with you everything that I did to, to have this success. And much to my surprise, at the end of that talk, I got mobbed, literally mobbed by people when I got off stage. And they all said basically the same thing. Loved what you said. I know I need SOPs. I don't know how to make them. I don't have time to make them. I don't know how to delegate. Can I just buy a copy of your SOPs? And I didn't think that was, it never occurred to me that people would want to buy a copy of SOPs. Uh, I know people like to buy training courses all the time. And so we decided to make them first available for sale. And the first week in, in our product launch, um, we sold 412,000 or so, I think if memory serves, roughly $400,000 worth of these things. And, and I was blown away. I, I couldn't even wrap my mind around making that much money in one week. And that was again, another really pivotal moment for me because I realized, so that was more profitable 
than my Amazon business was probably ever going to be. And um, I really was became, and, and I always wanted to own a software company, but I never had like an idea for software. And uh, once we had that first success from that first re- launch of those SOPs, I called my now co-founder, who is a very good buddy of mine and who's the technical half of the company. And I said, look, this is what happened. We need to build a software company because I think that this is going to be an amazing opportunity. And so we started writing code on Flowster in I think the fall of 2017. And then the first release to the public was a year later. So we wrote code for a year before we had a product that was uh, even, you know, ready for any type of beta release. And, you know, I can talk later if you'd like about how things have changed since then, but obviously we've, we've been growing at a great clip. I still own that Amazon hybrid agency. Um, at least I own it for the moment. There's somebody pretty interested in buying it at this point in time. So we're talking to him about that. Um, but my focus these days is very much on growing my software business. So it's been, I, I don't think I'm an overnight success by any stretch. I think there's a lot of people who are better strategists than me. I think there's a lot of people who are smarter than me. My particular zone of genius uh, is making sure that we have systems to run the business so that I can delegate all the minutia that I don't want to do to other people on the team that allows me to obtain the thing that I really, really want. And that is as much freedom in my life and in my schedule as possible. Yeah. And thanks so much for going through that. Um, and definitely want to get into what you're doing at Flowster and, and into the details on that, but to, to back up a little bit, I guess, like with a little time and perspective, um, why do you think you were so successful that fast, you know, doing seven figures in the first year? Can you piece that apart a little bit? Like what, what went yeah. into that success, both external and internal? So years ago, there's a uh, it, it, productivity is the short answer. The explanation of this is, um, so when I, my very first job, uh, I worked for a financial services firm and, um, the way to prospect for clients was to cold call and I actually got written up. So there's a book called, um, atomic habits by James clear. And if you look at chapter 16, I'm the subject of that chapter and I'm known on the internet as the paperclip strategy guy. So back then I developed my very first business system. I knew I needed to make a lot of phone calls, cold calls to get clients. And so I had two baby food jars and I had 120 paper clips and every day at the time I dialed the phone, I'd move a paper clip and I wouldn't stop dialing the phone until I moved all the paper clips every day. So a lot of brute force. Um, and so I, I knew that, you know, the way to grow faster, is just out hustle other, other people work harder, have a higher level of productivity. However, you know, fast forward to 2016, one, we weren't making cold calls. We were sending emails. And number two, I knew that, uh, that was a really repetitive and quite frankly, super boring thing to do. And I didn't want to do it. Um, and I didn't want to, so I figured out that I needed to send hundreds of emails every single week to prospective suppliers slash uh, clients. And there was a fair amount of research about, we, about 13 minutes worth of research needed for every email that we were going to send. So if you want to send 200 emails a week, do 200 times 13 minutes, that equals more time than I wanted to devote to doing that. So I thought, all right, well, this is, this is a task that does not require the judgment that comes from years of experience in the field. This is a task that is paint by numbers. Do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. It was super repetitive. So it was pretty easy to write a set of instructions on how to do that. And that's what we call a checklist or a standard operating procedure. And as soon as I did that, that then gave me the freedom to pass that off to uh, a small group of virtual assistants in the Philippines who I could employ. And I think at the time we were probably paying like three bucks an hour. So $3 an hour, my, I don't know about you, but my time's worth a whole lot more than three bucks an hour. So I'm very happy to pay somebody else $3 an hour, which is uh, at the time was the market wage in the Philippines. It's gone up a little bit since then, but not a bunch, um, maybe four now. But it allowed me to... S- to without breaking my back and without working a gazillion hours, still achieve the desired output of a couple of hundred outbound emails every single week, week 
after week after week to the tune now, I think we've sent like 30,000 emails to suppliers over the last six years. And let that number sink in, 30,000 emails. Now these were um, not just exactly the same email to every single supplier. We did a lot of split testing and so forth and so on. But the, the, the thing that I did that most people don't do, because I've talked to a lot of people in the space, they try and do it themselves, especially in the beginning, because they, first time entrepreneurs, they have a mindset issue. And unless they fix it, they'll only ever, they'll, they're unlikely to succeed. And the mindset is, well, I don't have much money yet, so I'm gonna do everything myself to keep costs low. Well, yeah, I guess in theory that's true, but if you're not looking at uh, unit economics of time and ROI, which is something that doesn't necessarily occur to the first time business owner, then you're gonna be making your first mistake because doing all that work yourself is stupid. Why on earth would you spend any time, especially if you're someone, why would you spend any time doing something that you can pay somebody else three bucks an hour to do? Especially if, if you're someone who's still working for an employer um, and you got a family and you got responsibilities, you have a very limited amount of time. And so I see so many people in this particular business opportunity, you know, they, they try and send like one or two or three emails a day in the evening. And they might get 20 emails a week out, maybe if they're doing all the work themselves. So in the period of six weeks, they're going to get, what is that? 120 emails sent out. Well, they've given up long before they ever land right. their first account because nobody sticks at something puts 10 hours a week in for six weeks with no results. Like nobody does that. They just give up. They're like, oh, this doesn't work. And they go do something else. So they've made a fundamental error in that they've decided they're going to do all the work themselves, either out of ignorance. They don't know that it could easily be delegated. They don't know that they could hire a virtual assistant for three bucks an hour, or uh, they're simply just too frugal to do it which again is a, is a critical error because you're not an employee. When you decide to start your own business, you're not an employee anymore. You're a business owner. And as a business owner, all of your decisions have to be made from the perspective of ROI, return on investment. So if I can invest three bucks an hour and I can spend, you know, $400 or $500 a month on that labor and I can fill up my calendar with meetings with qualified prospects. And then I can use my skills to have those conversations and convert those conversations into business and into new clients and new relationships that's going to generate revenue. Uh, I'm going to get a pretty significant return on my $3 per hour investment. Yeah. I think you, you hit on lots of, of interesting points there. And it's funny because we we're in we're in that business, you know, we're basically in the the outreach business and we've seen it change a lot over the years, you know. And mm -hmm. I think the early the early years of our business, perhaps what you've seen as well, is that there really was much more of a paint by numbers dynamic. And you could send a lot of emails and get a lot of meetings and kind of just keep working this equation. And then I think and we're we're kind of you know niched down to the agency space and selling into agencies and we help agencies sell into brands and that kind of thing. So we're running, we're essentially selling into brands on behalf of our clients. And then what we saw is over the last you know five, 10 years or so, five years, let's say, because there's so many more agencies in this little niche what used to work stops working, right? And like yeah. what would work one month doesn't work anymore. And now it's the numbers game dynamic is still alive. Like you need the paint by numbers thing, but you also need a lot more personalization, a lot more creativity. As soon as somebody thinks they're on a list that doesn't work anymore. Um, so I guess like, I'd love to hear um, what, what is templatable and how, how much do these things have to be updated? And how do you think about how an SOP has to evolve over time? If that's not too big of a question. No, it's not. It's a very good question. I agree with you. Things do change over time. Our open rates and our, our, our the effectiveness of our relatively simplistic outbound campaigns is not as good as it was. So you need to adapt and that's just the nature of being in business. But again, so you, but you can, so let's talk about customization of an email because we're now at a point where most people have received enough template emails that they can smell them within the first three to five, seven words. And 
if so they even open yeah <laughs> they're not even and then you're going to get that in the preview so they're not even going to open it so the key to getting your emails open these days is and i'll, I'll claim a uh i'm going to quote a partner of mine in 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 my business a guy by the name of joe petruzzi he teaches people how to do this you need to make a claim so let's say dan that that i'm emailing all right i'm gonna make i'm gonna use myself as an example because i don't know enough about you without doing some research to be able to say to use you as an example so if i was writing an email to me and i wanted to get my attention i might say something of hey trent i i noticed that you've been podcasting now for a number of years and you've interviewed so and so and so and so and so and so i also noticed that your company's been on the Inc. 5000 a couple of times and that you're a, a father with a kid. Like, man, I don't know how you juggle all that, but good on you. So that is uh, that information is relatively easily found about me on the internet. And if you teach, if you create a system for research, you can have a VA do that research and then you can create a structure for how to write those first three sentences. Because the first three, two to three sentences in your email need to be highly personalized. Like, here's what sucks. Hey, Trent, I noticed you, I love what you're doing with the Bright Ideas podcast. I get people writing me that all the time. Like, F off, dude. You haven't yeah. even listened to a single episode of mine. Whereas if you wrote, Hey Trent, loved your interview with Dan and how you talked about blah, blah, blah. Now I know that that person has at least invested some time in understanding who I am, what I'm about, et cetera, before reaching out to me. And I'm way more likely to yeah. read their email. Uh, I agree. And that's, that's where, you know, we've headed with, with the way we do outreach too, is to this higher degree of personalization. The thing that I, that I worry about with it is that it's just kind of this never ending arms race and the skepticism of the market keeps growing to the point where, you know, you assume everything is, is you're on, you're on a list, no matter what people include, fill in the blank, Mad Lib template, you know, sort of thing. The thing that, and I could be wrong about this, but where, you know, we've sort of taken our business on this hypothesis and I want to get to what you're doing. So I don't mean to take over, but um, is, is that the thing that is going to be timeless is the sort of tribal connections that we have, right? If mm -hmm. you, if I send you an email and you're like, okay, this person's referenced this element about our industry, this group that we're in, they have this person that we know in common it's going to be pretty hard to ignore that. You know, if there's a chance that we're in the same tribe, um, that's at least going to be read and taken seriously. So that's, that's kind of where, but, but I love, I love the idea writ large. I think we're preaching the choir here about, um, about finding a way to systematize, you know, this kind of research and the need for personalization. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying is true, but you also have to remember that you're not striving for a hundred percent reply rate. So there is absolutely value in, again, I know, cause I know my metrics that in order to get the number of replies that I need, I have to send a hundred emails every week. And I know that if I customize the first three sentences and I have a VA do 10 minutes of research for each email so that they can customize those first three sentences. I know that my open rate is going to be 2x or 3x or my reply rate is going to be 2x or 3x would it otherwise be or maybe it'd be 10x what it would otherwise be. I don't know those stats off the top of my head because I have an employee that runs that for me. And I don't do that personally. Um, so I, you have to strike a balance, I think, Dan, between, hey, I want to have like, like every we're all on a list. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like yeah. everybody's on a list. You're on lots of people's lists. Get over it. It's just business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have to strike a balance between, you know, I, I'm trying to be your best friend or I'm trying to sell you something. Well, in my case, I look business as business. I'm trying to sell you something. Yeah. And, and I'm reaching out to you because I'm trying to sell you something. Now, I deeply believe in the thing that I have to sell. I think you'd be great to have it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be reaching out to you. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to sell you something. And people, I think, in business are aware of that. And so... That's where the rest of your email becomes incredibly important. And, and that hasn't changed much. Um, the rest of the email can be fairly templated 
because it's speaking to the needs, wants, and desires that someone in your position, for example, if I'm pitching marketing agency founders uh, to buy my software, I know that marketing agency founders struggle with delegation. I know that they struggle with working too much. I know they struggle with profit margins and I know they struggle with scalability. So if I have the, after the first three custom sentences to let you know that I acknowledge you're a real human being and you're unique and I'm not spamming you, that's where the rest of that sales copy uh, is going to come into play. And if I send enough of those, uh, I'm going to get replies. And if I get replies, then I'm going to have conversations. And if I have conversations and I have great content because I'm doing content marketing as well, I'm going to get meetings. And if I get meetings, I'm going to get clients. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it, it is a balance between the personalization and scale. And if you're just writing everyone custom love letters that take 20 minutes each, that's just going to break and, yeah. and it's not going to work either. So, so I couldn't agree more. So to, to kind of move into Flowster, can you talk about that a little bit? So what happens when somebody signs up and logs in? What do they what do they experience? So before we dive into that, let me just explain what Flowster is very briefly, uh, because it, it's it's important to understand the difference between process management, and that's what Flowster is for, versus project management. Because most people, unless they're a process nerd like me, they don't they don't necessarily make a distinction between the two. So a project, you don't know every all the steps in advance you're not you're probably not going to do the exact same project 150 times or 400 times or whatever and it's a bit of a dynamic fluid you know and you need project management software like asana or ClickUp or teamwork or there's a gazillion of them to help you make sure you don't drop the ball process management software on the other hand is hey i have this thing i, I ideally i want to delegate this thing to somebody else and um, we're going to do it over and over and over and over again. And that's the specific you and, and, and with any in any business or even any project, there's going to be lots of processes that are required uh, to make that business run or to make that project a successful project. So when when you sign into Flowster and you can get a free account at flowster.app, one of the very first things that we're going to do is direct you to our template marketplace. And the reason that we provide that is, is I know from firsthand experience that while everyone really loves the idea of having SOPs, nobody's excited about making them. So we provide hundreds, and in one day it'll be thousands, of pre-made templates, um, both produced by Flowster, but we also have a partnership program where other companies can come in and they can publish templates for the users in the Flowster community. Um, so if you're, if someone who's listening is like, well, I have expertise in so-and-so you might want to come check out Flowster because you can actually make money off of the platform by selling your SOPs. So when people log in, they're going to be, um, directed to the marketplace and within the marketplace, they can browse around, they can find whatever they want. They can add it to their account. And if it, if it isn't suited to them exactly as it is, they can hit the customize button and they can, um, customize that SOP template or checklist, if you prefer the word checklist, in whatever way they would like. And it, there, that will help you to get a lot uh, further along to your goal of delegating. And one of the very first things that everybody can do is start to delegate their inbox management to their assistant. We call it inbox shadowing. And that is a monster time saver. I've done webinars about this where people are like, oh yeah, I could easily save like five to eight hours a week. And so we have a process in there for inbox shadowing. So if you don't, if you've never hired a VA before and you aren't really sure what they would do, start with that. What, uh, can you go further into that? What does it entail? So inbox shadowing, as, as I'm sure everyone who has an email address knows, you get a lot of stuff in your inbox. And as the owner of said inbox, I know that I don't need to be the eyeballs on all of those emails initially. Many of them don't need my attention. Many of them are junk. Others don't necessarily need my personal attention. Others are asking fairly routine questions and someone could reply on my behalf. So we there's a process in this inbox shadowing SOP that tells you how to structure your inbox and how to use labels and divide it up into various sections. And then you just write guidelines for your virtual assistant on how to address uh, the emails that are coming in. And if you follow the process, you'll find, because yeah, this works for me, I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid. 
I am probably down to, yeah, I don't know, on a given day, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes on email versus the two hours that it used to be. Um, and, you know, for example, let's say I get a rather routine question. When I, when my assistant was new to this, she would type the reply and leave it as a draft with a label on it called please review. And so I'd go look at it and I'd like it and I'd click send. Well, that's a whole lot faster than me typing up the reply. And once that particular question comes in, you know, more than one time, eventually my, they're not leaving it as a draft. My assistant's just doing the reply for me because it's more or less the same answer every single time. When something comes in that she has no idea how to handle, then she applies the please handle label to it and it goes into a specific section of the inbox. And then when I reply on that, I'll BCC her or I'll CC her so she can say what I said. So if something like that comes in again in the future, she can probably type the draft for me. The other thing that that uh, takes a lot of time if you're not doing it the way I'm about to describe is what I'll call post meeting follow up emails. So you have this meeting with a client, you talk about all this stuff, and then you got to email them afterwards. So if you have four, five, six, seven back to back meetings in a day, you got a lot of work ahead of you to type up all those emails, you'll probably forget some details, especially if your meetings are back to back, and you weren't able to and you didn't take really great notes. So instead, what I do is I just pick up my cell phone, and I'll take like 60 seconds, and I'll dictate into the cell phone. I'll say my, car, my assistant's name is Carla. Hey, Carla, I just met with Dan. We talked about so-and-so. I said I would send him a link to this article and this article and this article, and I would do this, that, and the other thing, and then go ahead and type that draft and, and, and leave it up for me to review. So I've taken what was probably 10 minutes worth of work that I didn't have time for because I got back-to-back -back meetings all day. And All right, so we're having um, some technical issues here. So if this seems like a Frankenstein uh, recording edit job, it, it is. Um, but we were basically talking about how you can better set up processes for saving lots of time by having, you know, VAs and such record meetings, really useful stuff. And um, without going further into it, you know, people can kind of get access to that by, by going to Flowster. I, I guess with, with that trend, um, what, what are some other examples? Like what, what are the most popular SOPs you're seeing right now when people log in? Um, anything to do with growth. So one of our popular playbooks um, is our upbound marketing playbook because anyone who's in B2B sales of any kind needs more appointments. And as I talked about very early on in our interview, all of that prospecting and the customization of the emails and so forth is, is delegatable if you have a process and a system to follow. So the outbound marketing playbook, uh, which is one of our premium playbooks, gives you all of the checklists and everything you would need to build that tech stack, to hire a VA, to get them trained and get them to the point where you're literally just hands off. And then we have, you know, man, there's so much on there. There's yeah. a whole, there's categories for lead generation, categories for marketing, categories for social media, selling on Amazon, um, doing SEO. I mean, there's, there's just so much. So it's really hard for me to, uh, to give you a specific answer other than to say, you know, if anyone is thinking, hey, I need more SOPs, given that it's free to go log in and just browse around the marketplace and you just search and look at the categories, I would encourage people to do that. Yeah. And what I love about it is like, even if you don't end up using one, if you already have a rough idea, it's really just kind of like a second pair of eyes, like kind of saying like, am I crazy to approach this thing in this way? And then finding out, you know, uh, how to kind of reconnoiter what, what else you're doing. So I, I love that. I think it's like very actionable compared to just like reading a lot of tactical books that might be somebody else's winning lottery ticket numbers. This is actually something that you can kind of like play with and modify and make it, make it work for yourself. So I think it's a, it's a great concept trend. Um, and kind of getting towards the end of the time, one question I like to ask is like, what are you excited about? You know, like, what are you, what are you planning for 2022 and so on? So I'm excited about a lot of stuff. Uh, in the first quarter of 2022, we have three new playbooks that we're launching. Uh, just in another two weeks or so, we're going to be um, doing a release of an updated version of the Outbound Marketing Playbook. We, over in middle of February, we're going to be launching, it doesn't even have a name yet, 
Um, I'm just referring to it as the agency playbook. Somebody else owns the trademark for that, for those two words. So I can't use exactly that, yeah. but essentially it is a huge playbook for marketing agencies. And in the, th in March, uh, pretty sure we're going to be launching a, uh, webinar playbook because webinars is something that I've had a great deal of success with. As a matter of fact, I've sold more via webinar than I have by any other method. And we've partnered up with easy webinar to do that. And that's just the first quarter. Um, beyond that, I haven't planned any further. I only plan my quarters one at a time. We have a number of partnerships that are in the works that are as a part of that first quarter. And then the other thing I think that I'm super stoked about is we have a Chrome extension in development, which I think is really going to be a game changer. So the marketplace is great because it gives people pre-made templates, but no matter, everyone is going to want some custom templates for this, that, or the other thing. And while Flowster does make it simple and easy to make those templates manually now, it's still not as fast as we'd like it to be because you got to take screenshots, then you could drag the image into the template, then you got to type the words, etc. So with the Chrome extension, um, you'll basically be able to install it and hit go. And each time you click your mouse doing the thing, the Chrome extension is going to take a screenshot. It's going to put a highlight around where you clicked and it's literally going to build the Flowster template on the fly for you so that by the time you're done doing the thing, you also have a template that's ready to go. And so that should allow our users to make a lot more custom templates with a lot less elbow grease, so to speak. And then the last thing is uh, our Powered by Flowster initiative. We've had a lot of requests from our user community to be able to allow them to embed workflows in their websites. And so you think about when you, know, when you go to a website that has like a chat bot and it's powered by Drip, it's powered by this, it's powered by that. This particular piece of functionality will allow people, anyone who owns a website to, let's say they want to produce a workflow as a lead magnet as opposed to a PDF or a video or whatever. So they'll be able to create the template in Flowster through their own Flowster account, but then they can publish a workflow, which is just an instance of that template on their website and people can come and use it and work their way through it without necessarily having to sign up for a Flowster account. We've had a ton of requests for that and that's actually literally only a couple of days. It's in the final phases of testing right now. So I'm particularly keen to see over this year how many websites can become quote unquote powered by Flowster. Hopefully it will number in the thousands and that's more links for us. It's more traffic, it's more affiliate referrals. It could be a, a real big game changer. Yeah, very cool. And good luck on a, on a smooth launch with that. And uh, we'll make sure to get everything linked up. And Trent, thank you so much for your time. No problem, Dan. Thank you very much for having me.